This is a statement from Combinatorics. It doesn't look like it's very important. It turns out it is important and it's going to be very, very useful. You're really going to like this property. To make it a little concrete, let's say that n is 10 and k is 3. Then this statement becomes 10 choose 3 plus 10 choose 4 equals 11 choose 4. So that's kind of a strange thing for the first sight. The number of times we can pick 3 out of 10 added to the number of times we can pick 4 out of 10 would be the number of times we can pick 4 out of 11. That's, that's kind of a strange statement. As it turns out, it's true, and we're going to see several proofs for this. First one will be a combinatorial argument. I'm not going to use n and k in this proof. We're just going to use the numbers. That a and b sets defined as shown. So a is just the set of first 10, ten counting numbers, and b is almost the same, but we added 11 in there. So A has 10 elements, B has 11 elements. We, we defined A and B, and we're going to prove this statement by counting the four element subsets of B. We're going to count it in two separate groups. The first group of subsets are the ones that contain 11, and the second group will have subsets that do not contain 11 in them. Okay, so let's see those numbers. We're looking for the number of four element subsets of B. In this particular case, if 11 is already in there, then we're generating a subset, we, we just have to pick 3 out of 10. So the number of, so the number of sub four element subsets with 11 of them is this many. And the other one that doesn't have 11 in them well, then it's a subset of A. A four-element subset of B that does not contain 11 is a four-element subset of A and vice versa. So that's 10 choose 4 many. And so when we add these two, we get that. Kind of cool. So one, one more comment. Notice that this proof, this argument works perfectly with N and K and not just 10 and 3. So nothing specific about these numbers were used. Okay. Okay, so this is the statement that we're going to prove. This time we're going to use variables and we're going to prove this algebraically. The plan is as follows. We're going to translate these combinatorial expressions and rewrite them in terms of basic operations, add the two, and simplify the sum in the hopes that what we're going to end up with is this. And that's what's going to happen. So let us first translate these expressions. n choose k and n choose k plus 1 are quite similar. In the second expression, both the numerator and the denominator has an extra piece. There is an n minus k here. All the others are common to the two. So there is going to be a huge common factor. And also k plus 1 factorial equals to k plus 1 times k factorial. So what we're going to do is we're going to add these two, but first, we're going to bring them to the common denominator. The denominators are almost the same because this one has k factorial, this one has k factorial, and an additional k plus 1 factor. So we get the common denominator if we just multiply this one by k plus 1 over k plus 1. And so now we're going to add the two, and we have a common denominator, k plus 1 factorial. And on the numerator, we have a gigantic common factor, right? All these are part of the common factor. So we're going to factor that out right away. n times n minus 1. So that's the common factor. And what is left is back there. There is an extra k plus 1 from the first expression and an extra n minus k from the second expression. k cancels out. And what we're left with is n plus 1. Ooh, that kind of belongs here. So what we have is n plus 1 times, n times, n minus 1 times, all the way till n minus k plus 1 divided by k plus 1 factorial. Our proof is complete if, if this is really just n plus 1, choose k plus 1. And the denominator works. So all we have to do is to figure out whether the numerator is what it should be. So what would be the numerator here? 
we would start computing m plus 1 and then and then n minus 1. Now the question is where do we stop? We should have exactly k plus 1 factors here. Here is a little trick we, we can do. Let's call this 0, this second piece here. That is, what, that is what is being subtracted from n. So then the, this would be 1, and the next factor, that's n minus 2, would be 2. And then here, what are we subtracting in the last one here? We're subtracting k minus 1. For this, first one, negative 1, because actually, well, technically, that is what we subtract from n. And so now, these little numbers, they're growing by 1, so they're counting, but we're starting, that's a strange way of counting to start from negative 1, so let's add 2 to every single number. Then we start at 1, the next one is 2, and the last one is going to be k plus 1. So 1, 2, 3, all the way to k plus 1. So this is indeed k plus 1 many factors, which means we have the right expression. So it's proved. This proof is not going to be really different from the previous one, only now we are using this different form of the combination formula that is more widely used in, in the US. But the ideas and the steps will be pretty much the same. We express n choose k and n choose k plus 1 and we are going to add them together. In order to add, we have to bring stuff to the common denominator first. Still, k plus 1 factorial is the same as k plus 1 times k factorial, which means that we can match the k part of this denominator to this one if we just multiply both numerator and denominator by k plus 1. Now let's investigate this other group. If we simplify n minus k plus 1, that is the same as n minus k minus 1. That is 1 less than n minus k. So the second denominator is missing an n minus k. Uh, we're, we're applying the same trick that n minus k factorial is the same as n minus k times the factorial of the rest, n minus k minus 1 factorial. And so we just, we're going to have the common, common denominator if you multiply the second fraction's numerator and denominator by n minus k. So we're adding these two things together, so we're adding these two things together we are going to have a huge common denominator, right? The common denominator is k plus 1 factorial and minus k factorial. And in the numerator, we have, well, they're both divisible by n factorial. So let's factor it out right away. n factorial times k plus 1 plus n factorial times n minus k. So that's k plus 1 plus n minus k in this cute little parenthesis. This whole thing was common. K cancels out, and then what we have here is n plus 1. That will make, that will turn n factorial into n plus 1 factorial. So if we, if you want to get to here, n plus 1 choose k plus 1, that is n plus 1 factorial over k plus 1 factorial times n plus 1 minus k plus 1 factorial. So this is where we're trying to get. n plus 1 factorial we have, k plus 1 factorial we have. Here we have n minus k factorial, and here we have n, n plus 1 minus k plus 1 factorial. That is the same thing. The ones here cancel out. So we can rewrite this as n plus 1 minus k plus 1 factorial. So we can rewrite this expression as n plus 1 minus k plus 1 factorial. And that is exactly n plus 1 choose k plus 1, which completes our proof. So we have been looking at this statement, this strange little statement from combinatorics, and you have endured three different proofs of it, so it's just fair if you see some benefit of it. So here is why you're really, really going to like this property. Blaise Pascal was a French philosopher and mathematician, and what I'm going to show you is called a Pascal triangle. So here's how you generate the Pascal triangle. You start with a 1, and a 1, 1. You, want, you see it's like laying bricks. Every line is getting longer. So you, we always start with a 1. That's never going to change. But here now we have two numbers above this spot. We just add those. So there is a 3 here. Uh, for this spot we just add the 2 above. And when we run out of that, that is just an automatic 1. So this has 4 pieces. And then next up, 
We start with a 1, 1 plus 3 is 4, 2 plus 3 is 6, 4, 1, kind of fun. So this is Pascal's triangle. If we cleverly define the location of numbers here, then basically a number in the nth row and the case column is going to be exactly n choose k. But the first thing that you might notice is the binomial theorem in there, right? a plus b squared, a plus b, a plus b squared, a plus b cubed, a plus b. These are the coefficients of the binomial theorem, of those binomial expressions. If we start counting with zero, and these are rows, these are the coefficients of what? a plus b squared, a plus b cubed, a plus b to the fourth power. So we want to call this row, the third one, this row, the second one, is the first one, so this is the zeroth row. So every horizontal line is what we call a row. Now the columns are like this, they are tilted. And if we call this boring one the zeroth column, then the first column, look what the first column does. It counts 1 through n, and that's ac actually the same as n choose 1. This is uh, n choose 0, this is n choose 1, this is n choose 2. So if we start with zero labeling the columns, then this is the first, oops, second, at least get the third one. So this number here would be what? So it's a combination. So which row does it sit? It's in the fifth row. And which column? Zeroth, one, two, three. So this is the third column. So fifth row, third column. That is, the, the number that sits there in the Pascal triangle is five choose three, which is indeed 10. So the Pascal triangle is fantastic. There are all kinds of really, really interesting stuff going on. Here is an example that we're not going to have time for, but it would be lovely. There is a big difference between prime numbers and non-prime numbers. If you look at the seventh row and you just you ignore the ones, every other number there is divisible by seven. That's not the case with the sixth row, right? Fifteen and twenty are not divisible by six. And then the fifth row again, five, ten, ten, five. Third row. So the prime rows of the Pascal's triangle, if except for the ones, they're all divisible by that prime number. Let's see some more cool stuff. What happens if you add the rows? 1 plus 1, 2, 1 plus 2 plus 1, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. So the rows all add up to a 2 power. Then, if you add them, but this time you, you assign to them alternating signs, so plus, minus, plus, minus. See what happens? 1 minus 1 is 0. 1 minus 2, negative 1, plus 1, 0. 1 minus 3, negative 2, plus 3, minus 1. 1 minus 4 is negative 3, plus 6 is plus 3, minus 4 is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. So if you assign al alternating signs to, every, to the numbers in a row, then instead of a 2 power, they add up to 0. We get these combinations because the way we generate the Pascal triangle is exactly the way combinations behave, right? Here is n choose k, here is n choose k plus 1, and then when we add those two, we get n plus 1 choose k plus 1. One more thing and then we're done. If someone says, well, what is x plus y to the 8th power? So where the Pascal's triangle comes very, very handy is at the binomial theorem. If someone says, okay, what is a plus b to the eighth power? Then it will take exactly 30 seconds or less for you to generate Pascal's triangle till the eighth row, and those are the coefficients. You know the terms. So it takes you a bit of writing in both the answer and generating the Pascal's triangle, but it definitely beats multiplying out a plus b eight times. There are, in my mind, there are combinations, and combinations have a connection uh, with the binomial theorem. 
and the Pascal's triangle collects combinations. Khan Academy has a perfect lecture on this, but they kind of talk about these three things uh, all together. I wanted to show you this connection before we even mentioned the Pascal's triangle. So that's the only reason why you're seeing this video. Thank you for watching. This one.